Did dinosaurs evolve the ability to fly? In part one, we saw that a sequential reading of the fossil record does not in fact support the theory of the evolution of flight in dinosaurs. Please go to the link in the description for the video on this crucial background information. So what about objections? Why, for example, do feathered theropods have varying stages in wing and feather development? The illustrations depicting these developmental stages are real, even if they are out of order in the fossil record. As a Christian, I am told that this sequence cannot be an evolutionary one because I am bound by the evidence I find in Scripture. Having said that, however, I can fully appreciate why a non-Christian would join the dots into an evolutionary scheme. This is why creationists should never say things like there is no evidence for evolution. Whether we like it or not, this is evidence. So how should creationists answer this objection? Well, it may be that these so-called evolutionary stages for feathered flight are actually stages depicting a secondary loss of flight. <laughs> We have many modern flightless birds, such as cassowaries, emus, ostriches, and kiwi birds, among many others. Some of these might be secondarily flightless, thus making their wings and feathers vestigial. Something like that could have happened to many feathered theropods that were originally created as flyers, but then secondarily lost the ability to fly, causing their wings and feathers, and in fact their entire bodies, to change to new cursorial lifestyles. God did say to the serpent in Genesis 3.14, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Notice that God cursed both Satan and the symbol of Satan's deception, some kind of reptile. Notice also two other important details. First, God cursed all land-breathing animals. Cursed are you more than all livestock and all beasts. The second important detail relates to the physiological effects of the curse, both on the reptilian symbol of Satan's deception and the plant realm. It would seem that the rest of the biological world was cursed in similar physiological ways. Scientifically speaking, there is still much to learn about biological laws and principles. Unlike the empirically derived laws of physics that exhibit unchanging relationships among interacting elements from galaxies all the way down to atoms, biological principles are not bound by absolute and uniform laws. Biologists Parwan Da and Alessandro Giuliano put it like this. Our knowledge of laws, theories, and hypotheses can be traced to physical sciences. While physicists have identified a number of laws related to mass, energy, momentum, and so on, some of the laws known to biologists are those of Mendelian inheritance, metabolic scaling, and the recent power laws. However, even these laws are not absolute. They come with exceptions. It is therefore useful to think of biological regularities as broad generalizations than stiff relationships among interacting components. Of course, if we accept the scripture at face value, we should have no problem believing that the effects of the curse also included some supernatural aspects as well. There really is no reasonable ground to reject the hypothesis that all post-fall creatures, dinosaurs included, experienced massive amounts of rapid pre-flood diversification, whether through as yet unknown biological laws or through direct supernatural intervention. Of course, from a creationist perspective, it could just be that God created a bunch of non-flying feathered theropods. But we shouldn't rule out the possibility that some feathered dinosaurs were secondarily flightless. 
Some evolutionary scientists have actually proposed such a scenario. Gregory S. Paul in his book, Dinosaurs of the Air, The Evolution and Loss of Flight in Dinosaurs and Birds, is a good example. Paul believes that dromaeosaurs, truodontids, oviraptorsaurs, therizinosaurs, and ornithomimids all have characters that indicate they were fully flighted dinosaurs that became secondarily flightless. Alan Fiducia has put forward a similar hypothesis in many of his publications, but one can see why this idea is not going to catch on well in the evolutionary community. If most of these feathered theropods secondarily lost the ability to fly, then not only is the evidence supporting the evolution of feathered flight missing from where it should be, down here, it is also missing from up here as well. In other words, if what appear to be transitionary stages in the evolution of the wing and feather turn out to be stages showing the secondary loss of flight, then the actual evidence for the evolution of feathered flight from the fossil record falls very close to zero. Please join me in part three. I've got something really interesting coming up as a conclusion to this overall series. So that's all from me, Ken Colson here from Creation Unfolding. Don't forget I have more resources on my website, www.creationunfolding.com. Uh, I have a book, of course, if you're interested. And look, if you are in any way blessed by this video, then please hit that like button. I really appreciate it. Of course, if you want quicker access to more videos as they come by, then please subscribe and ring the bell while you are there. And of course, as always, please spare a moment even now and pray for me. I really need it. Thank you and goodbye.